if you think about our evolutionary history, it was the negative experiences that signaled the greatest threats to survival. So our ancient ancestors that lived to pass on their genes paid a lot of attention to negative experiences. Consider 80 million or 100 million years or so of mammal evolution, starting with little rodent-like creatures dodging dinosaurs to stay alive and have babies in a worldwide Jurassic Park, constantly looking over their shoulders, alert to the slightest crackle of a brush, quick to freeze or bolt or attack, depending on the situation. Just like any rabbit or squirrel you may have seen in the wild today, the quick and the dead. That same circuitry is loaded and fully operational in your brain as you drive through traffic, argue with your mate, hear an odd noise in the night, or see in your mailbox an unexpected letter from the IRS. First, the amygdala, a part of your brain that's kind of like a switchboard that assigns a feeling tone to the stimuli flowing through your brain. In other words, is it pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral? And then the amygdala there are two actually, directs a response, approach, avoid, or move on, this part of your brain, the amygdala, is neurologically primed to label experiences as frightening and negative. In other words, it's built to look for the bad. For example, when someone gives you feedback, a parent, friend, lover, or boss, doesn't your mind go to the hint of criticism surrounded by praise? Mine sure does. Second, when an event is flagged as negative, the amygdala hippocampus, that's another part of your brain that's right next to it, the amygdala hippocampus circuitry immediately stores it for further reference. Then, from now on, it compares current events to the record of old painful ones. And if there are any similarities, alarm bells start ringing. Once burned, twice shy. Your brain doesn't just go looking for what's negative, it's built to grab that information and never let go. Sure, we can notice positive experiences and remember them, but unless you're having a million dollar moment, the brain circuitry for what's positive is kind of like a paper and pencil pad compared to a high powered video camera plugged into a fast computer with terabyte storage for what's negative. For example, when you look back at night on a typical day, what do you usually reflect on? The dozens of mildly pleasant moments or the one that was awkward or worrisome? When you look back on your life, what do you think about? The 10,000 pleasures and accomplishments or the handful of losses and failures? For most of us, it's a tilt toward the negative. And then third, the negative generally trumps the positive. A single bad event with a dog, for example, is more memorable than a thousand good ones. Speaking of dogs, you might even know about the studies on learned helplessness from Martin Seligman and his colleagues, which illustrate this point in haunting ways. It took only a short time to induce a sense of helplessness in the dogs, whose brain circuitry for emotional memory is very similar to our own. But it took an extraordinary effort to get them to unlearn that training. It's as if we are predisposed to believe the worst about the world and ourselves and to doubt the best. Fourth, your own personal training in the negative, whatever it's been, shapes your view of the world and yourself and your personality and interpersonal style and approach to life. For example, in the extreme, such as with a serious history of trauma or depression, the hippocampus can actually shrink 10 to 20 percent, impairing the brain's capacity to remember positive experiences. This personal training in the negative can lead to more of it showing up on your radar, either because you are scanning for it preferentially or unwittingly, sadly, increasing the odds of it coming your way, which, in a vicious cycle, can make you even more inclined to see or cause the negative in the future even though the actual facts are that the vast majority of the events and experiences in your life are neutral or positive. It's not fair. Every day, the minds of most people render verdicts about their character, their life, and their future possibilities 
that are profoundly unjust. This negativity bias shows up in our lives in a number of ways. Let's consider three of those a bit here. Self-criticism, resisting the way things are, and envy or jealousy of others. As we go through these, please consider how you might be literally making yourself unhappy by engaging in one or more of these three. So much of the unhappiness we feel is self-constructed, self-inflicted. That recognition may make you squirm a little, but it is actually very hopeful, since if you are the one who is making you unhappy, at least to large degrees, that means that you can also make yourself happier. And then, further on in the meditations, we'll be exploring ways to deal with these tendencies. All right, let's start with self-criticism. Sure, there's a place for feedback since it's a key to learning, a place for correction, and even a place for a healthy wince of remorse. But most of us are incredibly harsh judges of ourselves. For example, if they heard someone speaking to a child the way they talk to themselves inside their own mind, they'd be appalled. It's not fair, it's not helpful, it's not right. For example, I was talking with our daughter the other day, she's a young adult, and asking her how she saw people making themselves unhappy. And she brought up the example of women judging themselves by the pictures of good-looking people in advertisements, most of whom have been photoshopped, in other words, fiddled with to create a kind of illusion. She was saying that we feel ashamed or unworthy because of how we fall short of something that's completely make-believe. So that's an example of the unfairness of self-criticism. Another way we make ourselves unhappy is we resist the way it is. You can accept things as they are without approving of them or preferring them. You're just being in reality, living in objective truth. And accepting things as they are also means we can work to change them. But if we resist what is, if we resist the facts as they are, we are immediately cast into the land of suffering because what is, is, whether we like it or not. Resisting reality makes us feel disappointed, makes us feel frustrated, let down, at war with the world as it is. It's very painful and not necessary at all. And then last, regarding envy or jealousy, I bet you are doing better in life than 99% of the people who have ever lived on this planet. I admit it, I certainly am, and so are most people today, certainly those people living in the developed nations. Yes, there are terrible things going on in the world, like the billion people or so who go to bed hungry every night. But to be objectively accurate in your own case, Please consider whether your food, your conveniences, your medical care, your education, your lifespan, your entertainments, your relative freedom from pain, and the opportunities you can give your children, if you have any, are all substantially greater than those of the richest person alive a hundred years ago, let alone the kings and queens of old. Yet in this context of hitting the human lottery to be alive today, as imperfect and maddening as this world is, we still find people to compare ourselves to and feel less than, or envious and jealous in regard to. Please consider how there are so many things that cause how any person's life turns out. If you can see the big picture of the causes that lead another person to be more successful or famous or have thinner thighs or be better looking than you, whatever, that can help you step out of comparing mind. And who knows what hides behind the face of a person who looks like they've got the world by the tail. As a therapist, I have so come to know what lurks in the secret heart of so many people who seem successful, and so many people that others compare themselves to and feel less than. It's important to live as who we are, 
shaped and floated in the great river of life by all the 10,000 causes upstream, very few of which actually have our name tag on them. And living in our own life without getting caught up in comparing ourselves to other people, we can pay attention to what's useful and beneficial to pay attention to. We are, in many ways, what we pay attention to, since what we pay attention to is the pipeline into the mind and therefore the brain. There's a saying in contemplative practice that we should guard the sense doors and be careful about what we let into our mind, including anxious or envious or jealous thoughts of other people. It's okay to think about some mistake or some blown opportunity 10 times. Think about it 10 times. All right, but 10, please, that's enough. 